Well, good morning, South Point. Hey guys, man, I'm so fired up. I'm believing God for great things. That on the other side of this camera, wherever this finds you, whether you're here in St. Mary's or Calvert County, maybe you're on vacation, uh, maybe you're somewhere all around the country, uh, maybe you're even watching this on playback at some point later. I believe this, that the Spirit of God is wherever you are this morning. Uh, and He has great things for us as individuals and as families. At South Point, uh, we say it all the time because we believe it's true that Jesus is a big deal. And if you grew up in a traditional uh, church environment, that might sound uh, simplistic or, or understated. Uh, but what it means is this, that we believe that a relationship with the living God through Jesus changes everything. Um, that Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection uh, is what empowers us to have peace with God, peace with ourselves, and peace with others. And, and it really does change everything because Jesus did what we couldn't do. He lived a perfect life. And, and I start out with this because I think a series like this has the potential uh, to add guilt and shame into our lives. And, and really, let's be honest, who needs more of that? Uh, last week, Jen kicked off this series and reminded us of this idea of, of the not enough, the not enough monster, right? This, this invisible force of the enemy, Satan, uh, that wants to whisper in our ear that that we don't have what it takes, uh, that that we're so broken and defective that we're unable to love and to be loved, uh, that that the dysfunction in our life is our fault and our burden to carry alone, and we just want to start out today with a by recognizing that the not enough monster never takes a vacation. Uh, he, he's always looking uh, to discourage you and to distract you. But we can start out with a declaration um, that because of Jesus, right, all God's promises find their yes in Jesus. And that means again, because of him, we don't have to be defined by our guilt and shame and failures. So we're gonna focus today uh, on parent-child relationships. But if that's not the season you're in, that's okay. You know, maybe you're young and, and pre-kids and you're living your best life. Like you get to sleep in and, and stay up late and just enjoy, man, that's, that's a great season, enjoy it. Um, but there's something here for you today. You know, maybe you're um, struggling with infertility and you would love to be a parent. Uh, and this idea of talking about kids just puts a lump in your throat and makes you uncomfortable. Man, know that God is with you, that he sees you and that there's something here for you today. Maybe you're single or, or you're in a relationship and you don't plan to have kids. That's all right. These principles, again, are transferable. And lastly, maybe you're an empty nester and you're like, oh man, I don't miss those days. Or maybe you do miss the days, right? But now you're in this great season where you can go to the bathroom without an audience. Uh, you can watch a season of Netflix and not be interrupted 14 times. And so, uh, man, enjoy that part of your life, that season. But we need you here too. We call this, this series Homemade uh, for two reasons. The first uh, is that we're all dramatically shaped by the homes we grew up in, right? We, all of us, you and me, we're, we're the DIY projects of our parents, our guardians, whoever raised us. Uh, and so uh, some of us turned out Pinterest perfect, and some of us, like me, you know, are missing some parts. And, and that's okay. Uh, that wherever we are, we need to come to terms with the, the reality of where we came from so we can realize how that impacts how we raise the next generation. Uh, and so whether you had a perfect childhood, an idyllic childhood, or, or a less than perfect story, I really believe that for the vast majority of parents, not everyone, but for the vast majority, our parents did the best they could with what they had, with what they knew at the time. There comes a time in, in every uh, adult's life where you realize usually it's a few years into your own parenting journey that our parents didn't know what they were doing either. And, and that's okay. None of us really do. The second reason uh, that we called this homemade is a reminder that homemade things are imperfect, right? That that's the way they're supposed to be. And so Aunt Jenny's cookies, they don't look like perfect uh, Keebler, you know, Keebler factory cookies. Uh, Grandma's blanket doesn't lay perfectly square on the couch like the one from Bed Bath & Beyond does. Uh, the veggies from your, your quarantine garden, maybe they don't look exactly as perfect as the, the pre-selected polished ones that we see on the grocery store shelf, right? But handmade, homemade things are imperfect by design. And the good news is that imperfection is not only welcomed in the kingdom of God, um, it's expected. And then sometimes it's even celebrated. So God's goal for you isn't a perfect family. Part of why I know that is because God didn't give us a lot of examples of perfect families in the scripture, right? As we look to the Bible, there's, there's not even consistently good families, 
right? It starts out with Adam and Eve. Uh, and, and from the get-go, they disobey God. They choose their own version of freedom uh, rather than perfection. And then from there, one of their sons kills another. And, and then for generations after that, uh, families steal and kill and, and, and uh, cheat each other for generations within the family, right? We get all the way to, to King David, who's known as a man after God's own heart, or Solomon, who, who is seen as the wisest man who ever lived. And neither of those guys are gonna be invited to the Focus on the Family podcast. They're not gonna be parenting experts. We move to the New Testament, and the book of Matthew opens with the lineage of Jesus, the genealogy uh, of where Jesus came from. And it's a list of adulterers and people with shady characters uh, and uh, broken and blended families. And yet that's the family tree that God chose to bring Jesus into the world through. That was God's plan. And so if your family doesn't look picture perfect, if there's not a mom, a dad, two kids, a cat, a dog, and a picket fence, like you're in good company. And as we, as we walk through the aspirations and the hopes that God has for us, uh, I, I want to again push back against the enemy who says, nope, this doesn't apply to you. It's too little, too late. Um, your family is different if, if they only knew about whatever it is, right? He wants to tell you that it has to be 100% perfect or nothing. And that's not the voice of your heavenly father this morning. Lastly, I'm gonna be super clear that I am in no way uh, an expert on parenting. I'm not the authoritative uh, expert. Uh, now, I have coached my kids' baseball teams. Uh, I take them on daddy dates. I've been to 99% of their events. That's the good side. Like in their whole life, I've done those things. I've also let them have unlimited screen time. Uh, I pushed one off a boat and I called them things I can't say on this broadcast. And that's just in the last seven days. And so uh, I want to be clear that I'm not perfect, that I'm on this journey with you. Right now, my kids and my wife are watching this with you. And so it'd be foolish to pretend otherwise. Uh, and so I just want to give that disclaimer uh, that I don't want you to hear me say, uh, follow me as I get it exactly right. Now, we've been very fortunate, uh, my wife and I, to have healthy kids. Uh, they all came into the world relatively uh, drama-free. We had a couple scares, but, but nothing like a lot of our friends have experienced. Uh, and so I remember when our oldest son, Drew, was born, and that feeling, a lot of people talk about it. I know Jen referenced it last week, um, but you don't really appreciate it until you walk through it. That feeling of like, seriously, you're going to let me take this thing home? Like, what, what do I do? How do I keep it alive? Uh, I don't even have houseplants or pets. Like, why, why do you think this is a good idea, right? And I remember that feeling, um, which is strange because I'm a, I'm a carefree person. Um, my parenting style these days, you know, uh, they give it a cool name, uh, free range, right? That sounds a lot better than what doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. Um, but, you know, so these days I'm, I'm pretty carefree. But I remember the early days, if there was one word I would use to describe my parenting style, uh, it would be fear, right? I was just constantly afraid because I had friends uh, who had lost kids tragically to, you know, window blinds, um, to pool accidents, to um, skateboard falls. You know, there's just so much danger. There's plastic bags, there's SIDS, there's bad guys on America's Most Wanted, right? And then at, at this time in history, by, by our youngest one, there was social media. And so, you know, social media inundates us and normalizes every possible negative outcome, every injury, every threat that can exist, we now know about it, right? And so we're just wrapped with fear. And then we add to it the comparison trap uh, that again, this is, this is uh, particularly bad for moms I know uh, of, of, you know, oh, your kid uh, crawled or rolled over or, or walked or pooped in the potty or swam or read a book or whatever it is, they did that first, they did that at this age and well, what's wrong with my kid? And, and what we really internalize is, what's wrong with me? What am I doing wrong? And so fear-driven parenting, you know, it, it starts with this idea of, of physical protection, uh, of safety concerns, but the not enough monster, you know, settles into our life and, and uh, permeates fear into all these other less obvious places. Fear makes us parent um, like our kids are something that we own instead of gifts that we've been entrusted with to launch into the world. Uh, and so uh, it makes us focus uh, on, on what they do rather than who they're becoming. And it begins to, to shape how we measure not just our parenting, 
Um, but ourselves, our, our, our whole selves, our very identity gets wrapped up in our kids. And so, you know, when we parent with fear, our identity, uh, we look externally, we look to the outside to our kids uh, to fulfill or to offset our insecurities, right? And so the mom who is, is unloved and unseen by her husband uh, just throws herself into the lives of the kids. And, and so uh, when they fail or they disappoint, it's seen as a personal offense against her. Uh, when, when someone inconveniences her kids, you can bet you're going to hear about it on social media. Or, or dad, you know, dad, uh, dad promised he wasn't going to be anything like his dad. And, and so he does whatever it takes to make his little girl happy. Or, or dad misses the days of being on the field. And so uh, even though he can't get out there and play anymore, he gets that same dopamine kick as he yells out, that's my boy uh, on the Friday night lights. But, but the problem is that kids... Kids aren't made, they're not wired to take on that kind of responsibility, right? I mean, they're, they're drowning, trying to figure out life on their own. Um, they're just trying to make it through this, this like weird new social media life that we all live where they never get a break like Jen talked about last week, right? And so they are just trying to survive and yet they're also responsible for mom and dad's happiness, Fear shapes how we measure success. Uh, you know, we again, we all know sports moms, dance, sports dads, dance moms uh, that are just totally overly invested in their kids' performance. And so they lose their mind when their little athlete drops the ball or when the ref makes a bad call, right? Uh, they, they take, again, personal offense when their kid isn't selected for the honors class or to advance into the next uh, gymnastics rank or whatever it is. Right, when we, when we see our kids as objects that we own, we, we then invest all of our time and energy and money uh, into making sure that they succeed, uh, into ensuring that, that no matter what, uh, that they succeed on the outside, right? And so what happens is that our relationship becomes transactional. And the transaction is this, I provide a house, I provide uh, nice clothes and, and sports and activities, uh, I, I let your friends come over, right? Uh, whatever it is that, that we provide as parents, we say, I provide this. And then on the other side, you provide love and respect to your parents. Uh, you're going to get the scholarship. You're going to provide the happily ever after. That's your part of the deal. And this idea of a transaction uh, settles in that when our kids violate this unspoken contract, it breaks the relationship, it hurts the relationship, and it dings our success as parents. And lastly, it makes us worry about our reputation instead of worrying about the relationship. You know, when we fall into this fear-driven ownership model, uh, we're more concerned with the outward appearance than we are with the heart. And so when she comes home pregnant, um, when he gets suspended, when he's not in the same classes that your, that your kids' friends are in, we begin, to, we begin to say right away, what will they think? What will other people think? They'll know I failed. That I'm a failure as a parent. That I didn't have what it takes. I can't believe you would do this. After all we've done for you, right? You know better. This isn't how we raised you. This isn't the way it was supposed to work. You guys, fear is a liar. It robs us of the love and the depth of relationship that God has for us. But Jesus shows us a better way. In 1 John, it says this, and so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Here's the kicker. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Why? We love because he first loved us. There's a better way. And the better way is to move uh, from fear-driven to future-focused parenting, to move away from measuring uh, our success by what happens today, right? Because mama said there'd be days like this. Uh, instead of worrying about today, we parent 
with the end in mind. We pursue success by shaping our child towards a better future, a healthier and more faithful future. The Bible has a lot of wisdom for parents. Uh, today, we're going to look at a foundational passage, not just for parents, but for, for really anybody who has a Judeo-Christian worldview, um, because this passage from all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 6 uh, is the foundational uh, source uh, of a prayer that Jewish friends pray twice a day, in the morning and the evening, called the Shema. And the Shema just means hear, because the very first word that we see in verse 4 is hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. See, as parents, we have to set the intention, uh, the declaration that in our homes, there is one authority, uh, there is one leader, there is one God. And that everything else takes a distant second. So who's the boss? God is the boss. And we have to remember that in this passage, Moses is addressing his people, uh, the Israelites. He's not referring uh, to a geographical place. He's not referring to the geopolitical nation of Israel that we can point to on a map. This is thousands of years before that. He's referring to the people of God. And so this applies to us today. Uh, he continues, uh, you know, sorry, this, this passage here, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Uh, the chapter before this, Moses had just restated the Ten Commandments, and this is a throwback to the first commandment, but it says, you'll have only one God, put him first. Okay, verse five, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. Right, Jesus famously quotes this uh, when someone comes to him and asks, hey, what's the most important law, right? There's lots of rules and regulations uh, in the faith, but like, what's the most important thing? And Jesus takes him back to Deuteronomy 6, uh, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And this sounds, you know, so simple. We hear it all the time. And yet, if we really process this, it would change everything. Um, that our highest goal in life is not to worship God or to serve God. It's to love him and to be loved by him. Uh, you know, we, we, we hear this idea that we are to worship God. And I want you to know, absolutely, um, you know, we, we are wired to worship. Uh, but the Bible describes that right now in God's presence, there is worship happening and there will be worship happening forever. Um, because to be in God's presence is to worship him. It's, our, it's a natural response to being in God's presence. But you and I, we weren't made for that purpose. We're not robots that are made to worship him. God's not up in heaven right now feeling incomplete and unsatisfied because there's some people that don't worship him. No, he goes, man, I love you, and I want you to know what it is to be loved by the Father and to love him in return. Um, that's the goal. Our goal isn't just to serve him. You know, we don't exist to serve. God didn't have spiritual children um, so that we would mow the lawn and cut and uh, you know empty the dishwasher. Uh, God, God didn't need us to serve him. Um, we get to do that. Uh, our goal in life is to love God with all that we have and to be loved in return with all that he is. Love God. If you do that, everything else will work itself out, all right? Verse six, these commandments I've given you today are to be on your hearts. And it's critical here we understand that he didn't say that it should be in our head. Because I think a lot of us, were content to, to know what God says. Um, we're content to be aware of what God says. But we haven't moved it uh, you know, down into the core of who we are to allow the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God to transform us from the inside out. Verse 7 continues, And press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you go and you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of the houses and, and on your gates. See, the difference between fear-driven parenting and future-focused parenting is right here. It's moving from being reactive to being proactive. It's, it's bringing intentionality into the what, the why, and the how uh, of our parenting. It's integrating faith with who we are, so that faith isn't what we do, it's who we are. It's bringing spiritual conversations, it's normalizing spiritual conversations in the house. 
and not waiting for church time uh, or for when there's a crisis. Because almost everybody, when there's a crisis, we get really comfortable having spiritual conversations, right? Because we're just desperate. Uh, but you know what? We don't have to wait for church or for a crisis to have spiritual conversations. Uh, it, it, it's not, it's not unnormal, right? It's actually, it's actually strange not to talk about it. That all around us is wonder and awe. That that when we go into nature and we see something that God created, it's natural to look at our kids and go, "Man, isn't it awesome that God is a creator that He made all of this diversity uh, and that He holds it all together?" You know, it's it's natural to talk about how uh, the ocean is 95% unexplored, and that the experiences that we have isn't all that there is, um, and that, that it's okay to have more questions than answers, and that we don't have to go through life being 100% certain of everything. It allows us to, to have conversations um, that we're unsure of what to do about, you know, education in a time of COVID. Do we, do we send our kids back to school? Do we do the hybrid thing? Uh, do we send them to Hogwarts? Like, what do we do right now? And to have a prayerful conversation about the wise choice, and then to trust that no matter what, that God is with us. And we can be certain that God is with us because of verse 20. It says this, In the future, when your son asks, what's the meaning of these stipulations and decrees and laws that the Lord your God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves in Pharaoh's Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. In the future, when they ask, hey, why do we do this Jesus thing? Like, why do we go to church? What's the big deal? We can point them to the why because they have to understand what it's about. They have to understand that we love God because he first loved us. And then the same way that God took the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and rescued them and took them to a new place, God has done the same with us, that he's rescued us from the slavery and the bondage of our own sin, of our own brokenness. He's rescued us and taken us to a place of grace, of new life. Uh, and, and so uh, God has taken us not from the presence of sin because we still have to deal with the reality of sin. We have to deal with the temptation of sin. We have to deal with the consequences of our own sin sometimes here on this side of, of eternity. Um, but even though we're in the presence of sin, we've been rescued from the power of sin. Um, from from uh, the eternal consequences of sin. And that rescuing is grace. That rescuing is Jesus giving us what we didn't deserve. It's Jesus being a way maker where there was no way to peace with God. And so we were slaves. Now we're not. That's the easiest way to say it. We were slaves. Now we're not. Uh, and because of that, a God who would do that can be trusted. A God that can do that, we can know that he will always do what he says he will do. And so why did I choose this passage today? Like the Bible is a huge book. There's a lot we could talk about that's more specific on parenting. Uh, but I think this lays out this idea of, of uh, spirit-led, future-focused parenting. And there's a formula I want to show you that I see from the passage, and it's this that law plus grace equals wholeness. That we need both law and grace to, to get to a place of wholeness. See, the law is for our benefit, right? You're not gonna look at the 10 commandments and see something you go like, I don't know about that, right? Like regardless of how you feel about Jesus, you're gonna say, yeah, you know, life's gonna work better if we don't kill each other. Um, no one wants to live in a world where we steal from each other without recourse, right? You'll be more content if you're happy with what you have, rather than wanting what everybody else has. And, and so, uh, again, regardless of Jesus, how you feel about him, um, the law is there for our good. It's there to help us, not to hurt us. And so the same thing is true of parenting, that, that rules and structure and, and expectation is good for a child. It's good and healthy and right. Uh, kids are born adorable, but they're also born selfish. They're also born wicked, right? Uh, and so they will scream to get their way. They will hurt their sibling or the dog when you're not looking. Um, they will make a scene in the grocery store because they know that you can't do them like your parents used to do you, right? They're, they're, they're born knowing how to be disobedient. 
Uh, and, and so kids need boundaries and structure to guide them to a place of wisdom. And so it's a natural part of the maturing process uh, for, for kids to break off that selfish identity. Uh, it's, it's a natural part of the process for us to help them break off that selfish identity, that tendency to center themselves and their pleasure uh, and their happiness over everybody else. And so um, this is going to happen with or without us, right? At some point, they're going to hit their head against this. And so we can spoon feed them all the way through college. But at some point, they're going to move out on their own. Um, they're going to get married. They're going to get a job, right? They're going to try to make it in the world. And if they haven't ever run into the law, right, if they haven't ever understood uh, that there are rules and boundaries and structures for a reason, um, they're going to end up fired, divorced, arrested, right? Because they're going to find out, with or without us, that our actions have equal and opposite reactions. And so there has to be law, right? We get that. But here's the deal. If the law was enough to make us right, we wouldn't need Jesus, would we? And so we need law and grace. Because we, we all know families with tiger moms, tiger dads, uh, who make sure that Johnny and Susie are right and tight, right? That, that you know, she letters and three sports, he gets all the good grades. Uh, they go to youth group. They do all the right things on the outside. Uh, and yet, when they graduate, they move out, and they almost never come back. Well, why is that? Because the law is incomplete. The law says when you fail, you're a failure. It says when, when you don't measure up, you don't matter. And that's not a safe place to grow. See, kids need the safety net of grace. Uh, grace, because, because homemade isn't neat and clean and perfect, uh, grace fills the gap between expectation and reality. Grace lets kids know um, that, that when they, that they're not measured uh, by their fears and their failures and their mistakes. Grace is the helmet um, that keeps them from cracking their skulls against the reality of life as they learn to make it through life on their own. Love that builds to a better future has law and grace, and it leads to wholeness. And when we get this as parents, it reshapes all the things that we talked about earlier, that when we look at our identity, our identity is no longer external. It's not and it's not given to us from our kids. It is, it is internal. It is fixed. It is from the Father. That, that our identity uh, comes from our Heavenly Father, not from our children. Uh, that I've been entrusted with one of God's image bearers. That, that, yes, it's cute that my kids have my eyes and my wife's nose. But man, more than that, I want them to have uh, the heart of Jesus. I want them to have the mind of Christ. I want them to have not the best of me and their mom, um, but the best of the Spirit of God inside of them. And so when we understand this, it will reshape our definition of success. See, fearful and, and insecure parents, we're concerned about the outward appearance. We're concerned about what, you know, now they know. Now they know that I've failed. What will people think? But when we understand that our future focus is on building not, not, the outside, not whether or not they get the ribbons and the trophies and the medals, uh, but, our, but our success as parents is in whether or not we've developed the unseen character that's going to equip them for a life uh, of fulfillment and success and wholeness. And then lastly, when we think about reputation, fear-driven people, sorry, fear-driven people ask, what will people think? They'll know that I failed. Uh, but when we, when we think about being future-focused parents, um, we, we recognize that it's not about our reputation. It's about trusting the reputation of our Heavenly Father, who said that He can work all things together for our good, that we can look at our own stories and, and see that God has used the good, the bad, and the ugly to shape us into who we are today. And because of that, we can trust that He'll do the same thing for our child. We can trust that God is able. And so, again, I just want to take us back to this Deuteronomy 6, that, that in the future, when they ask us, why do we do this? Why do we follow Jesus? Why do we go to church? What's this about? We can just remind them 
um, that God rescued us, that we were slaves, and now we're not. And because of that, he's given us a new hope and a new identity and a new way. And we're empowered to live a life um, that honors him. And so as we land today, I want to let you know that next week we're going to get more practical. We're going to talk, you know, practically speaking, how do we do this? Uh, How do we put this on on our hearts, uh, on the the hearts of our children? Um, How do we put them on the doorpost and all, all the imagery that was used there? What does that actually mean? But today, I just want to land on this idea, and I want to look at you and say, if you're listening to this today, and you go, yeah, this is interesting, this is cute, like, I, I would like to get there, I would love to be able to put God first and, and to have a future focus, but, but it's hard to look at the future uh, when the reality is I'm just, I'm drowning in the now. Um, I, I'm barely making it through. I'm in survival mode, Kyle. And, and so I would say, hey, I, I understand that. God, God sees that, knows that. Part of the deal is that you might have had a crappy childhood, right? You, you might have experienced some things uh, in your years that are now impacting uh, your ability to parent. And, and your only strategy is to not do it the way your parents did. And, and that's a partial strategy, right? Uh, and I just want to speak life and hope into you today that regardless of your family of origin, regardless of where you came from, um, that, that because of Jesus, you can start a new family tradition, that you don't have to be defined by the failures uh, of the generations before you. You can break the generational chains uh, of abuse and addiction and neglect. Uh, you can blaze a new trail because of Jesus. Here's why I know this. First Peter chapter 1 says this, Uh, For you know that it was not with perishable things like silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you, right? A lot of us were handed down some empty ways of living from our ancestors. Uh, But with the precious blood of Jesus, through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Listen, friends, um, even the best of parents hand down some empty ways, some brokenness from the generations before them. Um, Even if we had great parents, which which I uh, had some great parents, uh, we would say that that they were handed down some empty ways from their parents, and they handed down some empty ways to us. But the same power, but the same power that raised Christ from the dead empowers us uh, to a new way in a better way. That God is making a stream in the desert of our life. Um, that, that he is creating a new way. And that that can be true for your family. That you can hand down an inheritance of faith and trust in God. And it's not too late. Even if your kids are teenagers, even if your kids are out of the house, you can still... Choose a new way for your family, and you can pass down uh, a heritage of faith. Because of Jesus, we can throw aside the empty ways that were handed down and choose the grace-filled Jesus way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, I pray for every friend who's on the other side of this camera today uh, who is uh, processing what what you're saying and also thinking about all the things that are true in their life. And the reality is, I don't know everything. I don't know what you're walking through, but I believe that God does. And there is nothing, there is nothing um, that could disqualify you from these promises. That as we submit ourselves to God, that as we put God first, and we say, we choose Jesus, we choose the way of grace that you can do something that only you can do. That whatever has happened uh, in our family's history doesn't have to be the direction of our future. And so God, we pray um, that, that right now, any person who hasn't put their faith and trust in Jesus, maybe they know in their heads, you know, this idea that Jesus died for people and died for sinners, but they haven't let it go to their hearts. Um, 
that Jesus died for them, uh, did what only he can do, live a perfect life, die for us, be raised to new life. And because of that, and because the same power that raised Christ from the dead can empower us to a better future. Um, but that can only be true when we put our faith and trust in Jesus. And so today could be the moment. There's no special prayer. You don't have to uh, click a button. You don't have to email us. That right now you can do business with God. And you can say, God, I want to put you first. And I want to submit my family. I want to get my identity, my success, my reputation um, from God and not from the people around me. And so God, as you do that, I believe that you can change generations, um, that for their children and their children, that for the grandchildren years from now, um, that this moment could be the difference maker as we submit ourselves to you and trust that God is able. We honor you, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.